Warning, this video contains annoying flashy lights. Scenes of slight frustration. Things that mostly come at night, mostly. And a sausage dog in mild peril. You have been warned. Well, wasn't that all fun and dramatic? And now I'm here to sort of start talking and ruin everything. But welcome to my new tips video, centered around creating the 66 centimeter, one quarter scale alien queen head, much bigger than the ones in my last video. She's 99% FDM with just the teeth and the jaw sinew done in resin. And I hope you'll agree that she looks pretty sexy. Magnificent. And I'm gonna go over and share some new tips to you guys, whether you're new to the channel or not on how you can get amazing FDM prints with minimal finishing and then a fantastic paint job. So without any more self-indulgent pissing about, let's get on to tip number one. And I have to reiterate it, but it is to learn Blender or any other 3D software of your choice. All you need to do is know how to press G to move stuff or use these little handles, R to rotate, S to scale. You add stuff with Shift A, which you use as cookie cutters to cut up the SDL into more FDM friendly pieces, which I always talk about. And it really is my secret source to getting amazing FDM prints because FDM is so sensitive to orientation. And if you can go and see some tutorials, I've got some on my channel, but if you go see just some basic Blender proper tutorials, you'll get everything that you need in a few hours to take complete control of how you set up your FDM models to print on the print bed in the best possible way, such as like this jaw, you're basically gaining the power to turn any complex SDL into your very own model kit that's totally printable on your FDM printers. Speaking of which, right, let's quickly go through the settings. I'm using the Bamboo H2D 0.4 nozzle. It says I'm using the texture plate, but I'm actually using the Cryo Grip Frostbite from BQ. Link in the description. Came with the 0.8 extra fine preset, but with a few tweaks. Nothing on quality has been changed. I do find Bamboo's default settings to be excellent for the most part, apart from a few things that I just like to do myself. And I'm using Bamboo Matte Grey Standard Filament. The strength I put down the infill to 5%, I think that's what I can get away with. Speed, again, nothing changed on there. Support, I was worried about trees being too tall or too thin with such a tall print, so I decided to go with normal, which have plus or minuses. It's going to be good for the overhangs or underhangs, I think. With the Z distances, always put them to just under double or double the uh, layer height. This gives a nice enough gap for easy removal, but still supports um, the things it needs to support. No idea why I changed the uh, base pattern spacing, probably because ChatGPT told me to, which leads me handily to my second tip, which is if you're in trouble, use ChatGPT. I've been finding it very useful recently, especially when I've uploaded a screenshot of all my settings. It's told me a few things that need tweaking. It's not too bad on the 0.4 nozzle, but on the 0.2 nozzle, there's been lots of stuff it's been helping me with, especially with trying to print PVA supports, which has been a nightmare. But that's another story that will come to on another video. So try and use AI to help educate you as well, so we don't become overly reliant on it, become idiots. Did IQs just drop sharply while I was away? Okay, back to what's on screen. I mean screen. God, my voice broke there. I'll keep that in. As always, I made sure that my filament settings were calibrated correctly. You might have seen that I had my flow ratio just above one. Although I haven't changed many settings here, and your settings may be different to mine due to different filaments, different printers, obviously. But I will be making this 3MF file available with my settings all included. Obviously, don't include the SDLs from Wicked because that would be um, immoral of me. It will just have just a square in there. And that will be part of the project pack that I've started putting together for my videos. And that will all be available on my Patreon for the higher tier members. Link in the description. It's worth mentioning, actually, that my Patreon's only a month old. Thank you to everybody who's joined, free and paid. There's only 50% of the uh, introductory tier memberships available, which amongst loads of other cool stuff, it grants your access to a very active and supported discord so get over there grab them while you can back to on screen again as you can see 
total time for both plates combined was just over four and a half days. This might be a shock to you. It's long. How long? A long time, yes, but this is tip three. If you want the best quality FDM prints, you have to wait for them. So don't be scared off by dropping down to a smaller nozzle or a really low layer height just because the print times seem ridiculous. Because trust me, you'd rather spend an extra day or so waiting to get an amazing print than to waste one or two days trying to get a print done a bit quicker, but ended up not being as happy with it as you would have been if you just waited an extra day. And I say this because so many people in comments on YouTube or Facebook or wherever will always go, yeah, but FDM takes so long to print and that's why I don't use it, which is completely valid. But a lot of people, me included, don't really like to use resin. Okay, it prints amazingly and quickly, but the tidying up of everything, the cleaning of everything, is not, not just the prints, but your, all your equipment all the time as well. It's a pain in the arse. Okay, so if you're not running a print farm and you just want the best statuettes and figurines and dioramas that you can get with an FDM printer, being prepared to be patient with time really pays off. And as you can see on screen, to prove the point, this print is looking absolutely magnificent. Well, um, okay. If you look at it from some angles, yes, there are some issues, which is to be expected with an FDM printer, unfortunately. But don't worry, I'm going to take you through how I fix them and clean them up and we'll get it looking superb pretty quickly. If you watch my last um, video, the uh, head to head between the smaller uh, Alien Queen, you can see on the left, one made out of FDM, one made out of resin, you would have seen that I had a lot of problems with the resin printer parts warping and missizing and not going together very well. But I'm happy to say on the H2D using the BQ Frostbite build plate, the FDM pieces went together perfectly and would need only the minimum of filling and finishing. And as you can see, what really helped me out was planning ahead and putting in these pins ahead of time, which is tip four. Don't just take any old SDL and stick it straight on the build plate and add your supports and click print. Plan it out, think it through. What's gonna make your life easier in the long run? Do you need to take some parts off like an arm or a head so that you can print it better or paint it separately or transport it easier? Also, if you do that, you can take key parts of the SDL and print it at a lower layer height with a smaller nozzle. You don't have to try and do everything at the 0.4 nozzle just because you wanna print everything on the same build plate all at once. So plan what you wanna do, what you wanna achieve ahead of time, think it through. And you'll see there's probably a lot of ways to do it on the table that will get you a much better result overall and make your life easier as well. Back to on screen, everything's stuck in. He's looking a little bit gummy at the moment, but don't worry, once we get those teeth in, it's gonna look amazing. Now, you might be wondering why I've got such massive holes for pegs on the uh, main part of the head. Well, the thing is, I took the original SDL that was at 100%, which I think was at 1.6 scale. I then knocked it down to 55% of that, which according to ChatGPT was more like 1.16th scale. And then when I decided to print it as big as I possibly could on the H2D, I just grew it up by what I could fit on the build plate, which was 300% of the 55%, which apparently is a quarter scale now. But I forgot to change those holes. So how's about that for not planning ahead, eh? That sounded a bit Canadian, then. But it's all for added strength anyway, so it worked out okay. And the bits were a bit tricky to get together on screen, so I had to sort of grip it between my legs and improvise. So excuse me for being um, uncouth, but needs must. Or needs musted, because it was past tense. Nah, that doesn't make any sense. But whatever, as you can see, the join was pretty excellent. The kind of crisp, clean join you would see on a mass-produced commercial plastic kit. What wasn't commercial quality, though, is the fact that the supports did fail on this one side and the end of this sort of horn bit fell off and things were a bit scraggly. And there were these weird little gaps, which I weren't sure, but it looked to me, or reminded me of a little bit like when you're using damp filament, which is tip number five get yourself something to dry your filament in, such as this filler partner E1 from Chitu Systems, which arrived after I actually printed this project, but it's a very valid tip that I wanted to include anyway. And although I'm all set on my H2D with the AMSs from Bamboo, I will definitely be checking out the filler partner on my Bamboo A1 due to the AMS light looking a bit naff, to be honest. So make sure to get on top of your drying, even stuff straight out the package, because there's no guarantee that it's not taking on moisture during the manufacturing process. So. Yeah, get on top of your filament and drying. Anyway, time to print off a little bit of a fixed piece. I could have just done this in Blender by taking off the little horn bit itself, but I did it using Bamboo Studios tools and yeah, it's a bit more fiddly, but it's not too bad. And um, once that was printed and ready to be stuck on, I thought I'd try this new um, light curing putty, which is just UV resin mixed with putty. You can make this yourself with um, baking powder and UV resin, but you can get a little bit messy and you know, it'd be difficult to get the ratios right. So there is an off the shelf uh, product that you can get now, uh, which is tip six try new finishing products test them out 
see what what works with the way you do your printing and what and what fits with your workflow and expertise and particular likes and dislikes see i hadn't used this uv putty before i usually just used resin which can obviously be messy and a little bit fiddly to control it can easily pull into areas and hide detail you don't want it to hide you gotta be careful with it but i'm a creature of habit and i probably overuse using uh, resin as a finishing technique and i'm sure there's loads of other great stuff out there i should be trying so that's the tip really when you see somebody giving the tip in the forum or something like that or maybe in the comments if you've got a decent finishing product let me know in the comments then be sure to pick yourself up a small amount of each one try them out on some test prints and see which is working best for you don't just do i do and just keep using the same old thing even when the situation isn't really suited for it and to be honest i was a bit meh about the putty probably because i'm trying to put it into too fine a gap it sort of breaks up and goes chalky i think it's almost a bit too thick it needs to be a bit more viscous i don't know if there's different grades of it you can get some more runny than others now i was even thinking about putting a little bit of my own uv resin into it to sort of thin it out a bit and it does the same thing that uh, knifing putty that i've got tends to do which is when it starts to dry and you're trying to smooth it out it starts breaking off in little bit dusty bits and just looks a bit naff i might be doing a little bit wrong so if you see anything that you think i'm not doing quite right then again let me know in the comments i'm possibly overworking it but it wasn't really getting into the place i needed it to get into so i had to sort of overwork it and the thing is i don't want to have to sand it all back down again once it's on it's great that you can use a uv torch to sort of harden it straight away but then, oh, yeah, you still don't want to have to make more sanding for yourself. So once I used this reciprocal sander, which is all right, I only wanted to use it here because I thought if I did it by hand, I'd end up snapping the pointy bits off. But as I say, after getting rid of the worst parts, I, I did fall back to resin to give it a little bit of a coat over to smooth it all down. So after all that, it seems that a combination of the two substances was a good way to go. The putty was good for the bigger gaps where resin would just run straight through and just become embedded into the inner workings of the uh, print. But resin could come along at the end and just smooth over the roughness of the putty. A lot less mess, a lot less liquid resin used. So it's a bit of a win-win situation, really. Didn't take long and it was really easy. Then it was onto a quick priming with just standard grey. I used some Vallejo Mecha Colour Black primer as well for the base, but added a little bit of purple in there. The Mecha Colour is more like a really dark blue, to be honest, so it was perfect. And I'll explain the reason why I thought it was perfect in the next tip. But now, tip number seven. And this probably won't be up everybody's street, but seriously consider getting a little resin printer so that you can break off things like these really tiny, intricate teeth, combined in your skills that you learnt in tip one, of course. But here, instead of using the sort of cookie cutter technique, I actually went into the mesh and edited it directly. And the reason I did this is because as soon as I thought about doing the Alien Queen head large, I was like, I've got to do the teeth translucent and really high quality because on the last video, it was the teeth that really let down the FDM print versus the resin print. But I had to take each tooth out individually. It seemed the only way to do it. And then create roots on the top of the now isolated tooth and then make corresponding perfect holes for the root to um, nest into when they were ready to uh, be placed in there. And also it was a great opportunity to use the clear resin that any cubic were very kind to send me. Sorry to name drop there. <laughs> Whoopie fucking do. <laughs> hey, I'm impressed. Well, in the end, combining the power of both printing techniques is always going to be the best way forward, if that's possible, given your current setup. But I'll add a caveat there, saying that I think you need to be reasonably comfortable with tip one. Because if you give yourself the skills to take a complex SDL that you absolutely love and break it up into manageable and printable pieces, then the sky really is the limit. Now, as spectacular as these teeth looked, they looked a bit too much toy-like. In the film, her teeth actually go from translucent to black up towards the gum. And I have to admit, the thought of airbrushing black onto these now glued in teeth was a bit daunting. But this little touch is probably the most eye-catching and impactful part of the entire model. It's incredibly subtle, but it really just makes it look realistic. And that kind of leads us into the next tip, which is tip number eight. And it's what I alluded to a little bit earlier when I was talking about the base coat being not black, but being purple. On the statuettes and figurines that I tend to make that you've seen in my videos, they all have a sort of lived in sort of feel to them. I'm not particularly neat. I'm not particularly patient. And I don't really plan ahead with what I'm going to do. I just get a bit of a feel about what I want to achieve in terms of this texture that looks like rippling water to break up all the black and purple, which comes across very chaotic and messy, but it almost dazzles the eyes and makes it look 
absolute organic. And when you lay the same sorts of thing on top of each other with different uh, colors and uh, shades, you get this very complex, very organic looking thing coming out at the end. And nothing ever seems to look very good until the last couple of steps where bang, suddenly it all comes together. And then with a few coats of clear coat gloss, it really brought it to life. So again, another massive thank you to my Patreons, paid and free. Your support is amazing. But to anybody, especially people who've liked, comment, shared or subscribed, that gives YouTube a massive signal that people like my content. So keep it up, guys. I love the support. And if you want to delve deeper into any of the tips that I've gone through today, then check out all my other videos where there's loads more of the same stuff going on. I'll just shut up now and let you have a look at the big bitch yourself. Catch you next time.